Good evening and welcome to a very special interview show of The Broad. As per the latest media reports, Russian President Putin has shifted his family members and close ones to an underground secret nuclear proof bunker in Siberia and has ordered a nuclear evacuation drill as the tensions between Russia, Ukraine and the West escalates. On the other hand, the Russian Federation's officials have clearly stated that Indian companies will continue to provide pharmaceutical products to Russia despite sanctions and India has made it clear to buy the Russian oil despite all the sanctions. To talk on the Russia Ukraine crisis and its geopolitical impact on India I'm joined by Mr Yogesh Joshi from the United States who is a research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies of the National University of Singapore and a non-resident global policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars in Washington DC thank you so much sir for your time a very warm welcome to the prod uh thank you so much for having me on the show Uh, so sir i would like to begin the discussion uh, by the russia ukraine uh, crisis and then we will come to its impact on india so uh, my first question to you will be that what is your current assessment of like what is your assessment of the current situation and what are your thoughts on the recent updates that are coming from ukraine about the conflict uh so this is like the fourth week uh, you know uh, 25 of, uh, uh, yeah so you know uh, we are in, going to enter the fourth week now uh, and as far as the military situation appears to be uh you know uh, the russia it appears to be that the that the whole conflict has now moved into a situation of a stalemate uh you know uh the initial assumptions by president putin uh really didn't come through uh especially uh you know uh, thinking about uh, a swift uh foray into kiev uh which you know we all know hasn't really materialized um and you you would see that the war has turned uglier in a sense that the surgical uh you know uh, maneuvers which uh, the russian army start started with particularly avoiding uh, you know major casualties uh, you can also see initially in the first week that the russians had restrained themselves uh, a lot uh, particularly with the use of firepower and all that uh, that didn't really materialize you know Uh, and there are a lot of casualties on the russian side uh, some figures basically say 7000 russians russian soldiers have been killed which is uh, almost equal to uh, you know uh, uh, all the casualties which us faced both in iraq and in afghanistan uh, you know uh, in 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 both of those campaigns uh, so that's uh, that's a lot of casualties to take but also that they haven't been able to uh, you know get their primary targets which is basically kiev uh you know uh, there is ve- there is very vociferous fighting going on in many major cities um and you can see almost like a syrian replay uh happening in m- many of the major cities in ukraine uh you know uh, there is uh, there is some advancement in the south but again uh you know given uh the size and the firepower of the russian military uh it's been extremely surprising uh you know to say the least but it also tells you in a sense that how motivated the ukrainians are uh and with all the help they are getting uh you know to stop the russian advance and uh and not allow putin to have a swift victory so in a sense that the longer this war stretches uh you know the the cost ba- the cost uh benefit dynamics would shift towards ukraine even when they will lose uh some of those territories in a sense uh and the economic sanctions at some point in time would start uh hitting putin uh, quite a lot the russian economy it's already very isolated in a sense yeah. uh and these are some of the most you know stringent sex- sanctions ever uh you know introduced or levied against any any country let alone a major power in international politics uh so so far we are also seeing a lot of escalation uh particularly when it comes to not only on the side of the number of weapons being used the geographical expense of the conflict where russia has started hitting uh you know uh, uh western ukraine uh you know uh, training facilities uh in western ukraine uh but also in a sense the intensity of the conflict uh you know where you are doing you know you 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 basically doing siege of the cities uh the civilians are being targeted 
so it's it's going to become much more vicious. Uh, you know, and the war is going to become much more vicious. So we are already seeing some of those, uh, some of those, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, indicators, so to say. Uh, on the nuclear side, yes, there has been, you know, so Putin has been able to ward off the NATO, uh, you know, uh, 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 from direct intervention into the conflict uh, by smartly using the nuclear threat. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, the NATO won't supply, uh, you know, uh, a lot of equipment, which is actually hurting the Russians a lot. Uh, you know, uh, but at least all those talks about a no-fly zone or direct involvement of the NATO troops, that is something which is not going to happen. And that is primarily because, you know, in a sense, Putin has very successfully uh, used the nuclear shadow uh, to create enough doubts in the minds of the most ardent supporters of uh, direct, uh, you know, intervention Western interven intervention in Ukraine from actually, uh, you know, walking down that road. Yeah. Uh, sir, you talked about sanctions. So why is it so that Russian Federation don't care about sanctions anymore? What could be the possible reason behind this? Because we have seen that, you know, uh, after despite all the sanctions, Russia is doing what they want to do. So look, you know, in a sense that sanctions, in a sense, are no, uh, you know, there is no foolproof. Uh, you know, it's it's not as if it sanctions are kind of a deterrence, okay? Uh, and uh, Russia has been sanctioned since 2014. Uh, but if Russian interests and Putin's interests, um, uh, you know, if, if Putin thinks that his interests in Ukraine are far more uh, than uh, what uh, the costs of the sanctions are, uh, you know, then 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 sanctions fail in a sense, at least from from him initiating that action. So in a sense that, you know, just like deterrence or any kind of deterrence, economic deterrence with sanctions, basically, the promise of sanctions was about economic deterrence, uh, you know, which failed in a sense, because uh, in Putin's mind, the costs of, U of westernized Ukraine uh, is far more uh, than the isolation of the Russian economy. And they were trying to kind of create some buffer, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, from, from Western economic sanctions since 2014, uh, you know, Forex reserves of six, $650 billion, uh, trying to have, uh, you know, more indigenization, import substitution, uh, and all of that. Uh, but the Russian economy, first of all, is just $1.5 trillion in a sense. So, uh, you know, uh, it's 12th largest economy. It's not as much as China, so to say. So, uh, you know, even when you do all those things, uh, you know, you can't really uh, isolate yourself uh, from the Western economic sanctions. But I also think that there was also a calculation uh, in Moscow that uh, the West uh, would not rally together uh, to such an extent to impose such harsh sanctions. Uh, I think Putin miscalculated that. Uh, but once you roll the dice, uh, you know, it's very difficult to kind of, uh, you know, pull yourself back. Uh, that's the nature of, 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 of war in a sense, you know, you take that decision, uh, but it's also about much more about domestic politics, you know, in a sense that, uh, you know, without a sense of victory uh, to pull back at this point in time would be catastrophic for Putin. Uh, you know, um, and particularly in a political system like uh, like Russia, for that matter. Uh, so I think uh, he has no choice but to prod on at this point in time. Uh, and the sanctions will at some point in time start biting. But we should also understand that, you know, Russia is still getting a billion dollars uh, for all the gas uh, and uh, the oil it supplies to Europe daily. Uh, you know, so it's not as if uh, even when these sanctions have been imposed, uh, the Russian exchequer still has uh, a lot of sources of revenue. Uh, I also think that at some point in time, uh, you know, in Putin's calculation, uh, China would help, uh, you know, or is helping in a sense. And I think that was very clever on Putin's part to visit Beijing uh, in the first week of February. Uh, you know, to kind of get in some sense, uh, 
you know, some kind of, uh, you know, affirmation from Beijing. And there are reports now that Beijing actually knew about it. Look, the problem, in a sense that Putin has also, you know, kind of posed a fate comply to Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, so if you don't support Russia at this point in time, uh, then you're going to lose a major ally in future, uh, you know, and which China really can't, uh, you know, if Xi Jinping wants Taiwan or uh, wants to continue the expansionism, which he believes uh, is, uh, uh, is rightfully owned to China, uh, then you need an ally like Russia. Uh, you know, these are huge economies, there's a huge land pass. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they constitute most of Eurasia, so to say, uh, you know, so, so if you let Putin fall, uh, then you are losing a major ally. So in a sense that, you know, it's, you have, you have entrapped uh, China as well. Uh, and you're also banking upon in some sense, I think what we miss often is that maybe in Putin's calculation, the economic sanctions will not only hurt Russia, uh, but will also hurt the Western economies at some point in time, uh, you know, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, the tolerance threshold for Russia is far more uh, than it is for Western economies. So in the U.S., for that matter, the, uh, the, the price per gallon of, uh, you know, for, of, of petroleum, uh, of petrol is basically now increased by a dollar at some places, goes up to five dollars a gallon in some places, which is a huge risk for Biden administration, uh, you know, and you see a split uh, within, you know, might not be covered by Western media, but there's an underlying, uh, you know, uh, chorus of voices, uh, which are going after the Biden administration. Uh, you might not see the Democrats win uh, in, uh, in the midterm elections, so to say. So, you know, one of the calculations might be that to just weather these sanctions for another one and a half years uh, and then see some kind of change within the U.S. And we know how the Republicans feel, you know, or at least some sections of the Republicans feel uh, about, uh, you know, uh, about Russia for that matter. Uh, you know, so, so, so there are a number of calculations uh, which Putin might have made, but uh, the only thing which needs to be ascertained at the, uh, you know, underscored at this point in time is that at least for Putin, uh, you know, uh, the costs of waging a war in Ukraine, uh, you know, are less than the benefits, uh, you know, than the costs of basically of the economic sanctions. And until and unless that, that, that particular cost benefit analysis works in the favor of Putin's military operation in Ukraine, I don't think it's going to uh, it's going to change a lot. And lastly, look, at the end of the day, any settlement of the current crisis uh, would happen on mutual give and take. Uh, and if at some point in time, Ukrainians feel that they can't carry on, um, you know, and there is a settlement, uh, one of the precondition would be of lifting economic sanctions. Uh, you know, coming to India, so why is it so that India abstained on the resolution against the Russian Federation in the United Nations Security Council as well as the United Nations General Assembly, sir? Uh, so, you know, in a sense that if you look at, there's a lot of nuance in India's position and appears prima facie uh, when you're abstaining, uh, you know, that uh, you're siding. Uh, uh, but as Sayed Akrubid, Akrubuddin basically said, who was, uh, you know, the previous permanent representative to, yeah. to New York, uh, the Indian permanent, abstention doesn't mean neutrality, uh, you know, in a sense that, uh, you know, there are multiple factors uh, which go on, uh, which kind of feed into that decision. Uh, I think one of the fundamental things is that obviously you can count a number of factors which would have, uh, you know, uh, material factors, so to say. You know, defense dependence being one. You know, India doesn't want Russia to become a junior partner of China. Uh, you know, all these arguments are out there. Uh, um, you know, uh, India also feels the, but primarily, I think there are two reasons which I need to highlight. 
one is that any kind of condemnation of Russia won't stop Putin, yeah. uh, you know, from uh, doubling down on what he has, he's already doing. Okay. What isolation would mean is that basically it would, uh, it might isolate Putin more. And in such isolation, uh, you know, he would double down on getting his, uh, uh, you know, whatever he wants to do in Ukraine. So first of all, you know, condemnation doesn't really resolve the crisis. Okay. And for India, it doesn't matter, strategically speaking, uh, you know, the, the fundamental interest of India is for this conflict to stop. Because India is in a very difficult position, you know, in a sense, diplomatically. Uh, it is, it is aligning closer and closer to the West. Yeah. Okay. Which it needs for, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff for that matter. You know, even, you know, economically, if you look at in India, Russia trade, it's $10 billion, you know, with the U S it's $150 billion. Okay. If you look at the overall West, much of our trade actually happens with the West. Yeah. Uh, but it also needs Russia in a sense, not only to counter China in the future, um, but in a sense, to avoid Russia becoming a junior partner of China. Uh, and more this war drags, more is the possibility that, uh, you know, China would at some point in time have major sway on Moscow's decisions. Uh, so as soon as India can, you know, this conflict ends, uh, you know, it's better for India or any kind of settlement comes through. So that is one. You know, that basically that any kind of condemnation, yes, it works for domestic politics in, in, in the West. It works for, you know, kind of alliance management in the West. Uh, but just sheer geography of it, you know, doesn't allow India to take a similarly categorical position, uh, you know, because fundamentally the con who wins the conflict is not in your interest. You're not a party to the conflict. Uh, even remotely, so to say, so that you can choose sides. Uh, because in either case, uh, you know, you've, your interests will suffer. It is very different uh, from when if a similar scenario would be imagined in case of Taiwan. There, India has a clear priority in terms of who should win that conflict. Okay, uh, so that is one thing. Uh, the other, I think, important factor is that one should also understand, uh, you know, that there is some kind of, uh, you know, there is a deeper preference in India of genuine strategic autonomy, uh, you know, in a sense that India doesn't really feel uh, that all these sanctions, it is part of all these decisions which, is, which, which are being uh, made by the Western countries. So there is beyond defense dependence, you know, beyond a history of strategic relationship with Russia. Uh, I think there is also a deeper preference uh, that we are not entirely in the Western camp. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so that is a much more deeper thought and people like Rohan Mukherjee have talked about it, uh, where, you know, India feels that, uh, you know, on issues such as these, uh, you know, India needs to have uh, an independent voice. And when you compare, when you combine those two, where you don't really have an interest in who wins the conflict, but only an interest that the conflict ends soon, and you don't identify yourself fully uh, with, with the West on uh, alignment of values, uh, then you can understand uh, beyond, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about beyond those immediate uh, factors like uh, the defense dependence, uh, as well as, uh, you know, this long-term Sino-Russian alignment, uh, you can see a deep uh, uneasiness uh, in India uh, regarding, uh, you know, taking categorical positions. But also, you know, one should understand that there's a lot of nuance uh, in, in, you know, so 
in the first, on 22nd February, when there was the first UNSC meeting, India didn't even talk about territorial integrity and sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, but once Putin crossed that threshold of war, uh, you know, uh, India quickly, uh, you know, the Indian statement talked about territorial uh, integrity and sovereignty. Uh, you know, and you see from there on that without naming anyone, you know, India, in a sense, New Delhi is, um, uh, is, is, is basically talking, uh, you know, the, the statements kind of show greater concern for the Ukrainian position. Uh, even Prime Minister Modi, when he called uh, President Putin, basically asked for a ceasefire, immediate ceasefire. Uh, so I think there's a lot of nuance. Uh, and you you would have also seen the Indian judge in the International Court of Justice yeah. basically, you know, sided with the majority opinion and asked for, uh, you know, immediate cessation of hostilities. Uh, so I think uh, there's a lot of nuance, but fundamentally it is about that this is not a conflict. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking categorical positions would only, uh, you know, would not help, uh, you know, putting a stop to the conflict, but might exacerbate the situation. And fundamentally that, you know, even when, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is greater alignment with the West, we are not fully in tune uh, with what they're doing. Um, and fundamentally, I also agree with that, that, you know, in a sense that it is fine, uh, it, is, it, is, it is well recognized that Ukraine is a victim, but at the end of the day, Ukrainians can't change their geography. Uh, you know, uh, they have an agency, but you, but Kiev can't suddenly shift to the middle of Atlantic. Uh, you know, uh, leave aside Putin's craziness, uh, you know, uh, his disregard for human life and whatever it is. But at the end of the day, uh, strategy is also finally about compromise. Uh, you know, there is hardly ever a total victory. Uh, you know, if if all of us could basically get what we intend to get, uh, then the world would be a very different place. You know, the outcomes are always very, very different from intentions. Uh, and therefore, in a sense that I think there's a, India also believes, and I'm, I'm just saying, you know, and when I say India, it's basically, you know, um, what I think is that there's a lack of realism, uh, you know, that Ukraine is basically put onto a garden path, uh, you know, and uh, um, Ukrainians in some sense are suffering. Um, and uh, for the larger uh, egos of, you know, uh, of, of major powers, so to say. Um, and that doesn't mean that Ukraine doesn't really have the agency. But as um, India's former ambassador basically said, you can choose what you want, but then you also have to kind of deal with, uh, with the consequences of it. And at the end of the day, it is the Ukrainians who are dying, you know. Um, we can support, we can, um, you know, rally. Um, uh, but you can also see, uh, you know, that the lo real loss uh, is for the Ukrainian citizens and the Ukrainian state. Uh, so I think uh, those are the deeper, uh, you know, factors which are, which which can help us understand the Indian position. What will be the impact of this crisis on India, and how it will affect India's relations with the West? Also, to add on. India decided to purchase oil from Russia amid sanctions. So how do you see this decision by the Indian leadership? So first, I'll just want to answer that question about the Russian oil. I think the, the, the Americans uh, have also kind of, kind of accepted that, you know, but one should also understand that the Germans are buying it. You know, the whole, the, the whole of Europe is buying it, even when they have a greater stake and they are the ones most vociferous um, uh, on sanctioning, uh, sanctioning the U sanctioning Russia, R U.S. only imports ten percent of its oil, and it can ramp up its indigenous production to kind of make up for that. Uh, you know, so one should understand that the economic sanctions which the West has imposed on Russia has far 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 wider implications for Africa, for Asia, for that matter. Uh, you know, countries, um, uh, you know, where, which, which will have to deal with these economic sanctions because Russia is such a major producer of raw, raw commodities. Okay. Um, so that is one. So, and everyone, even Biden for that matter, is taking decisions to shield uh, U, U, U.S. consumers from economic sanctions on Russia. So is Europe. 
you know when the when german foreign minister basically says that without russian oil germans will freeze everybody is also looking at their own citizens so i think fundamentally the first duty of the state is towards its own citizens uh, you know so in a sense that there is no so if if one can talk about the morality of indian position i think there is no gr- greater morality than to look after your own citizens uh, you, you know so so uh, so that's that's that bit of it and india will do it uh, you know especially if it, if it is getting uh, those commodities at such a low price uh, you know at, especially at this point in time and uh, you know we will basically you know kind of sideline those uh, those economic sanctions through uh ruple uh, ru- rupee ruble agreements where you directly deal in terms of your local currencies which was also the thing which india used to do with the soviet union during the cold war and it works in india's favor th- because your forex are intact uh okay. so i think indian 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 trade you know whether it is uh defense or energies energy imports or raw commodities will continue uh you know but uh in a sense that it will also it will become tougher and tougher in the long run okay we we did the same thing with iran for that matter you know but ultimately we had to give it up uh so it ultimately depends upon how long the conflict goes on okay um, what kind of a settlement it will bring uh and whether russia you know those, those economic sanctions and uh, how categorical the west would be uh you know over the long term so to say uh, uh so those are those are the things which which will which will basically determine uh india's at least in terms of energy imports uh you know and raw commodity imports from russia uh, uh and russians in sense in some sense have all all the incentive to kind of uh, you know a big basically giving all the incentives to india you know i th- i just heard that they want the indian pharmaceuticals to now enter into the russian market in a major way uh you know so so these are pulls and pressures uh you know and i think india has in look india is not a small country in eastern europe okay uh at the end of the day it will do what is best in its interests and there is a lot of talk about how it will hurt uh uh you know uh india's relations with the west but i think much of that talk is in the analytical community uh you know um uh, who have a job to analyze and have to take a position but i think at the level, level of the government i think governments are much shrewder than that and you can see uh you know the the balance in uh us government pronunciations in a sense uh you know where every single time when um they have been asked categorically about indian position they have been able to manage to give an answer which doesn't really hurt india uh you know so so that tells you uh in a sense that uh they understand uh you know the, what kind of a position india is in and if you actually you know it doesn't serve the purpose of washington dc or european capitals to to push india into a corner in any case uh you know you need all the all the assistance all the help all the support you want at this point in time uh you know so uh, so that is one thing but look what's what's the larger lowest common denominator of of western and indian interest which is china which is not going anywhere yeah okay so until unless that thing is there uh you know you can work around other things uh so i think uh, and 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 india's india's approach should be that you know that we have not agreed on uh uh, uh we, we are first of all not your alliance partners okay which basically means uh that we have not agreed that we will be uh in alignment on every single question yeah okay once you are a security partner and you're looking at uh, you know american security guarantees then you are Uh, in kahoot lock stock and barrel india is a much large country you know it's not as if tomorrow um, and also much more secure let's let's just accept that fact you know we haven't seen uh, the kind of existential uh, you know uh, uh, questions of survival as other countries in asia or in europe yeah. you know so we haven't I, seen it 
Yeah, I want to add one point. Like many Indians on social media, uh, before thinking anything, just they write on social media, India is an ally to Russia, or or they write that India is an ally to US. Why are they not taking sides and stuff? So all to all these people, I want to say that India is not allied to any country. Just because we have bilateral partnership, that doesn't mean that we are aligned to that country. So these things, you know, uh, the the information needs to get out uh, to normal Indian public as well about yeah, the difference yeah. between a bilateral partnership and alliance. Yeah, in a sense that look, at the end of the day, it's about your interests, no? Uh, so, uh, how aligned are your interests, and how uh, how existential are those interests? Uh, you know, so uh, uh, and and how how much of those interests you can actually uh, you know um, achieve by yourself? Look, fundamentally, it's about you know at the end of the day, a, a state of India's size. Uh, you know, and capabilities, uh, particularly because you you are fairly secure, even when you have like, you know, Pakistan, which is a revisionist, pricky neighbor, and a major power um, in the Himalayas, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, you know, it is not as if PLA can roll down to Delhi any other day, you know, and we haven't seen those existential crises as in Vietnam, Korea, Japan, for that matter. Uh, you know, even in China, you know, the Japanese occupation of China, we haven't had that experience, uh, you know, and, um, and we are not going to have that experience anytime soon because of the inherent, uh, you know, capabilities of the Indian state. And this is something which we, which we, which we should acknowledge in a sense, you know, and at the end of the day, uh, the borders in South Asia are more or less frozen because of the presence of nuclear weapons. You know, anything like Ukraine is unthinkable in this context. Uh, you know, so you are a fairly secure state. And therefore, you can deal uh, with major powers on your own. Uh, you know, um, uh, if you would have been a state in Eastern Europe, uh, which has gone, which has a history of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 of Soviet repression for that matter, or Russian repression for that matter, your psychology would be very, very different your threat perceptions would be very, very different. So one has to give the due to those guys in a sense that, you know, they are in a very precarious position. You are not in a sense, you know? So I think that your inherent capabilities uh, give you certain, certain uh, space to maneuver. And the whole idea of selective alignments is basically that uh, you develop those capabilities. Uh, and India's, uh, you know, preferred way of balancing has always been internal balancing, that you get stuff from others to balance internally, uh, you know, uh, to build your own capabilities. Uh, the only time I think, you know, uh, uh, and it fundamentally depends upon the context, the only time I think India used a sense of external balancing was signing the treaty with the Soviets in 1971. Uh, but not many people know that the Soviets proposed that treaty in March 1969 after the China-Soviet clashes. And India waited for two years until unless it actually needed it. Uh, and then in some sense, operationally abandoned it as soon as the Bangladesh war was over. You know, so it fundamentally depends upon if tomorrow we find, and I also don't want to say that we won't uh, in future, because if tomorrow we see that we can't really, uh, you know, uh, stop the Chinese juggernaut, then we might actually ask for external guarantees of some kind of treaties with much more, uh, you know, stronger um, uh, alignment with the U.S. And so fundamentally, it depends upon the context. It fundamentally depends upon your interests and your own capabilities. And they may shift to your advantage or to your disadvantage. And as they shift, uh, you know, your approach to external balancing and uh, greater alignments will also change, but that is natural in a sense. But at this point in time, that is not uh, the context. You know, that is not what we are, we are not at that moment right now. Yes, sir. So I would like to conclude by asking that recently the Australian Prime Minister said very clearly in a statement that coordinations accept India's stand on the Russia-Ukraine war. So what is your analysis of this statement and what will be its impact on all the other coordinations, be it Japan or the United States? Look, in the Quad, I think, you know, India stands out. 
you know, Japan and Australia are treaty partners of the U.S. Okay, their security is guaranteed guaranteed by the American military and American nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, they are part of the global West, so to say. Uh, you know, India is not. Okay, so uh, yes, there is. Look again, the 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 idea of the Quad, the lowest common denominator on the Quad is China. It's not Russia. Okay, so until and unless the China factor remains, the Quad will continue to do its job. Yeah. And it's it's very important to understand that the moment you expand. Uh, you know the 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 agenda or the focus of such groups, which came into being on a very specific interests, uh, then basically there is uh, there is there is there there are there are chances that that may lead to uh, you know in a sense uh, greater disillusionment. Uh, or create fault lines within these institutions. Institutions work on the basis of core core interests and particularly security interests, security institutions. Um, and I think, look, there is no harm in the Australian Prime Minister, the Japanese Prime Minister, or, uh, President Biden, to basically ask India to do more. Okay, you would do that. Any any you know that's the part of diplomacy in a sense. Uh, but they have not gone out of the way saying that, oh, India can't be a partner of the Quad because of that. You know, in fact, one can see that, uh, you know, um, after the Ukrainian crisis, uh, the Quad has become far more active. Uh, you know, because fundamentally, at the end of the day, the threat to the Indo-Pacific is that the Americans would now be distracted towards Europe. Yeah. And there is no Indo-Pacific strategy without India, in a sense. Yes. Uh, you know, but one, one, one must un also underline this fact, not only are the Japanese and the Australians treaty partners, uh, but they are once removed from China. India is the only country in the Quad uh, which has a continental border and one of the largest, um, you know, longest boundary dispute with China. So, you know, in a sense that uh, you know, that both not being a part of uh, treaty commitments, but also sharing a border with China, uh, India's interests, in a sense, uh, you know, and uh, its strategy to deal with China would be different uh, compared to uh, other Quad members like Japan, Australia, and the US, uh, which is very, very natural, in a sense. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable thoughts no, and yes, valuable thank you so much uh, opinions for on all these topics. And uh, we really hope the situation between Russia and Ukraine, you know, there's some kind of ceasefire as soon as possible and the uh, tensions, uh, you know, relaxes. So thank you so much, sir, for your yeah. time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Yeah.